This is a film about bull sharks, and while we were making it, something terrible happened. I'd certainly be very nervous about doing this on my own, but I'm with shark behaviourist Eric Ritter. Hi, Eric. Hey, how are you doing? There are bull sharks all around us. Your studies are trying to get you into the mind of the shark, is that right? That's correct. And particularly how sharks interact with humans. Ah! Oh, the pectoral fin just touched my leg there, and she, like, almost, like, lifted it out the way. She doesn't want to touch us, does she? I mean, there are a dozen big bull sharks here, oh, yeah. 450 pounds, yeah, eight look, feet look, long. Look, 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 look right here. Wow! These sharks could easily take you out. So as long as we don't move, you know, and they realise we're not a threat to them, they couldn't care less. And then... <laughs> I can't believe that happened. I'll never forget how effective those teeth and those jaws. I mean, Eric's leg, in, in, the bite was in the calf, and it was just like us biting into a watermelon. And this is a man who knows sharks and works with them nearly every day. Later, I'll ask him what went wrong. I'll also meet the top three deadliest sharks and find out why bulls are considered the deadliest of them all. I'll examine baby bull sharks. I'll get into the water with the biggest bull sharks and, against all my instincts, feed one by hand. Sharks have an image problem. Some of us think of them as giant monsters looking for people to eat. But in fact, most species of shark are just too small to do us any harm. This is a gorgeous banded bamboo shark. You find it here in the rocky reefs around Australia. This is a juvenile, but even the adults don't get much longer than five feet and 80% of all shark species are smaller than we are. But even the big ones can be just as harmless. This is a leopard shark. It grows up to 11 feet long with these beautiful ridges on its flanks. It's usually found cruising over sandy sea floors near coasts and coral reefs. You may have heard that if sharks ever stop moving, they suffocate. Well, not this one. It can pump water over its gills. It eats shellfish and crustaceans, but never anything bigger than small fish or octopus. This is so unlike the popular image of sharks. If I'm gentle, I can even turn it over and tickle its tummy. In fact, the two biggest fish in the sea are sharks, the whale shark and the basking shark, and they're never a threat to anything bigger than bits of plankton. So of all the shark species in the world, only a tiny percentage kill people. Of those killers, three stand head and shoulders above the rest. off the coast of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, one of the best places in the world to meet one of them. It's a shark that has a reputation that's as bad as the Great Whites, but it's only found in subtropical and tropical waters. A remora. There's eight species. All of them have their dorsal fin modified into a peculiar sucker. You often see them attached to sharks. If a remora knows anything, it's when there's a shark in the vicinity. And here comes a tiger shark, heading for our bait, a drum of fish oil and chunks of mackerel hanging from a float. 
tigers have a reputation as man-eaters. But the truth is, they'll eat just about anything. They're so unfussy, their stomachs can be like junkyards. Sometimes humans get in the way and are eaten almost by accident. I'm six feet tall, she's 12 feet long. They can grow to 18 feet. She's not really interested in me. She blinked. I think I frightened her. But it's easy to see that if a tiger shark was in a mood to eat and was eating anything it came across, there could sometimes be a human in the mix. Seems like she's interested in swallowing my fin. Among the objects found inside tiger sharks, there's been a car license plate, an aeroplane propeller, even a suit of armour. But there's another legendary monster in the sea that's not so indiscriminate. This, of course, is Jaws itself, the Great White, the largest of the flesh-eating sharks. Great Whites are fussy eaters, but in murky water or in surf, these predators can take a bite out of us to see if we're edible. I'm safe now because in clear water, these intelligent fish can see I'm not worth attacking. I'm just too scrawny. Most scientists agree that bull sharks are more of a threat to us than either tigers or great whites. I'm going to find out why. And I'm going to start with the babies. I join another Eric, Eric Hofmeyer, at the mouth of America's biggest river. We're in the Mississippi Sound here, and this is a remarkable nursery for baby sharks. We put a 500-foot net at. How many could you catch? In a six-hour period, we caught as many as 220 sharks. 200 and... So and that many different species? Uh, up to four or five, six different species at, a, you know, at one site, yeah, is normal. And, of course, the one I want to see in my first bull sharks. Bill? There's a few fish in here, presumably those struggling in the net, they would actually bring in the sharks. I would, I would assume so, yeah. I've, I've pulled many fish out of the net that have been cut in half. This is thrilling. We don't know what we're going to get here. A lot of these, these fish, what are these, Eric? Uh, they're what we call pogies. Yeah, this is the number one food source for most of these sharks in this area. They school up and these sharks just go crazy. We got one here. Oh, up and in. First oh, shot. Oh, look. That, Eric, what, what is this? This is a fine tooth, is it? Oh, yes, it beautiful. is. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. And you're going to get measure that. Get it back in the water as quickly yeah. as possible. Eric, so why, why are these called fine tooth? They've got beautiful blue sheen, but why do they get that name fine tooth? The fine tooth, they're, they have the name fine tooth because their teeth on both the top and bottom jaw are the same. They're both And pointed. most sharks, they're different. Yeah, it's usually pointed on the bottom jaw and it's... Some that's type for grasping. Of, and then great. some type of cut in for the, for the top jaw. Right, and that's, that's great, isn't it? Wow. And then you put a tag in, and this doesn't hurt them at all. This is important work because you want to learn about the baby sharks in this nursery area. Exactly. We'd, we'd like to know how far they're traveling around in this area. Yeah. Just watch yourself. Let him go. There we go, mate. <laughs> Got another. There are so, oh, look at that. So many of these. Eric, look. A sharp nose. Which is gorgeous, shark. I mean, these white spots along the side. This, this is as big as they get? Uh, they'll get a little bit bigger, but yeah. 
about three feet long. Mm -hmm. Look at those eyes. <laughs> here you go. Wee! This is incredible, the number of sharks here. I mean, this is so exciting. We need a bull shark though, Bill. Try to bring one up. on. <laughs> They're coming in thick and fast. Yeah. Shark after shark. Got a different one here, Eric. Quick, can you give us that look? A scallop. Hammerhead, wow. Look at that. Beautiful. That. Gorgeous. We've got a. How many of these do you get? This is a rare one, isn't it? Yeah, these aren't as common as some of the other species that we find, but they're always a treat to get. These are the weirdest sharks. Look at those. Look this at is an amazing eyes. head. <laughs> Daylight was running out. We moved closer to the shore in our attempts to catch a bull shark. Please, we need a bull shark. Yeah, I think I got one. Bill, bull shark. Is it the first bull shark? What a magnificent. Got to get the top of the head there. Eric? Baby bull shark, this yeah, is cute. I mean, they're two and a half feet long when they're born. How, how long is this one? This guy's almost a meter, about three feet long. Three feet long. And the, and the mothers have about 12 babies, up to 12 babies yeah, up in to a, a dozen litter. in a litter, yes. Yeah, and you're, you're going to mark this one? Yeah, let me tag this guy in and you can have a look at it. Have a close look. Such a gorgeous shark. <laughs> Great. My first meeting with a bull, and as you can see, it's a classic shark. The same family as the reef sharks, the oceanic white tips, two dorsal fins like all of them. And imagine, if you're bitten by a shark, you see it for just a split second, how can you identify which species has done the attack? The surefire way to tell is this head. Look at this. This amazing snub snout. It's got a shorter snout than any other species of shark. These tiny piggy little eyes, that's another feature of bull sharks. Also, when they're adult, they don't have black tips to the fins. They have this dark grey colour. This is a baby, probably only two or three months old. You can see the umbilical scar there. That's where it was attached to the placenta of the mother. Bull sharks, they give birth to a litter of live young. This is about three feet long, and it's extraordinary to think that in 10 years or so time, when this is six feet, this can be a real problem to people. Back into the water. Off you go. Now, I'm going to try to follow a baby bull in the water. I can't wait. This baby is already a killer, but on a different scale. In the southern United States, bulls and other sharks use mangrove forests as nurseries, hiding amongst the roots and feeding on fish that come in and out with the tides. The baby is always on the lookout for fish, just as someday it will be on the lookout for bigger things as well. Right now, though, big things don't register as food. It's not interested in me at all. But let it spot the silvery flash of a mullet, and it's just as deadly as it ever will be. Bulls are pretty feisty too, even the babies. The one we filmed attacked the camera. Watch this. Bull sharks have attitude. Just before the accident, Eric Ritter and I were talking about how temperamental bull sharks can be. Bull sharks have got a reputation for being very aggressive, and as sharks go, they're high in the hierarchy. They're yeah? very high in the hierarchy. And some studies have shown they've got really high levels of testosterone. And at a carcass, they are so aggressive, they push a lot of other sharks away. They sure do, yes. Yeah. These are the big guys. Yeah. One way of comparing the aggression of bull sharks and other sharks is to go hunting amongst them.
If you want to risk a shark attack, spear fishing is one of the best ways of doing it. You're after fish, the sharks are after fish. You're no longer just a possible prey item, you're a competitor too. When a fish struggles on the end of a spear, it bleeds into the water and its struggles send out pressure waves. All of this can draw in sharks. Most of them, such as this scalloped hammerhead, are frightened by a human in the water and turn away. But big bull sharks keep on coming. This spear fisherman is sensible. He's kept his catch on a long line, and if he doesn't care about losing it, doesn't try to jerk it away, he'll be all right. As he rises, he's careful to leave the fish dangling right in the same place. There, the bull shark is fearless. The fish is torn right off the hook. Back to the boat without a catch, but in one piece at least. With their awe-inspiring weaponry, bull sharks can afford to be fearless. What a fantastic collection. How, how long have you been collecting these? Been collecting these for uh, over 30 years now. Wow, and the, the jaws of a tiger shark. <laughs> yes, this is a jaw from a 15-foot tiger shark. And, that, and that, I've read in books they've got teeth like the cones of a cockerel. Never understood why, but you can see this is a bizarre shape, isn't it? These teeth, you'll notice, are much thicker than a normal yeah, shark's. That, that allows them to bite through the uh, shells of sea turtles without breaking their teeth off. Oh, wow. Can I go and see the, the bull shark and great sure. white now? This is what I came here for, to compare the jaws of the great white shark with the jaws of a bull shark. And the teeth here, perfect triangles in a great white shark. These serrated edges make them ideal for slicing through mammalian flesh. And if you look at the bull shark, they're smaller teeth, but the structure is virtually identical. These are the jaws of an 11-foot bull shark. They don't get much bigger than this. And this creature would be a very dangerous animal indeed. Look at the back of the jaws there. You can see all sharks, they've got replacement teeth. The teeth don't grow in sockets in the jaws, they go directly from the gums, and the gums are always moving them forward. So if these front teeth are blunted or damaged, there's always an understudy ready to take their place. But these flashing teeth are backed up by really powerful jaws. Sharks don't have bones, of course. This is cartilage, or gristle. It's just like the stuff in our noses, in our ears. That's what gives them their shape. But in the shark, what gives the jaws the toughness is their big deposits of calcium phosphate. In life, these jaws would be loosely attached to the skull by powerful muscles and ligaments, and that means the shark can flash the jaws forward, just like outstretching an arm. But why do so many people come into close contact with the jaws of bull sharks? Where they hunt is one reason why people can come into contact with bull shark jaws. So they've got a reputation for ferocity, but that's quite often because they're in shallow water and they exactly. can't escape. Exactly. And you see now from the, from the rocks from the bottom, a lot of the noise is bouncing back. So I don't want to say they're confused, but you know, a lot of stuff is going on, so they're very, very alert. So close to shore, bull sharks can feel hemmed in. Us humans are most likely to swim and play in the world's warm, shallow waters, where bull sharks like to cruise and hunt. The shark comes into the shallows, not expecting a forest of human legs. The predator is here for rays, a favourite food.
the shark can feel it's been cornered, maybe, and that the swimmers are somehow competing for its prey. This time, it's a ray, but in these circumstances, people can get attacked. This is Durban Harbour, the busiest port in South Africa, and for young fisherman Imran Sheikh, the scene of a nightmare attack. He managed to get in the way of a feeding bull shark. Hello, Imran. No fish yet? No. Imran, it was a night that changed your life. I mean, where did the attack happen? Right there, at the Green Boy, just before the channel. And you had a real epic battle with the shark. Yeah, true. And what, what happened? As I was walking to, uh, to cast my bait, um, I heard a splash behind me. It was really murky water. The shark was going for fish, and it collided with you. It was a real fight. I mean, you were hitting it with the rod. It took you three times, didn't it? Yeah. I had to kick myself out of it. The shark nearly severed your foot at My the foot. ankle. It was a quarter of a mile back to shore. You had the best surgery and they, they couldn't save your leg. Yeah. These are Imran's x-rays. The shark didn't bite through the bone, as we can see that the bone is, uh, is intact. He had uh, tendon injuries, his blood vessels were torn, and he had uh, soft tissue defects as well. We discovered that his foot was not viable and we had to amputate. We found this uh, tooth fragments within the wound. They were later taken for analysis. The pieces of broken teeth proved that a bull shark was the culprit. And how, how are you coping with that now? It took me quite some time to get over it. I'm still mobilizing, I'm still fishing. And still fishing in the same, same. spot where the attack happened? Yeah. And do you, do you blame the shark? No, I don't blame the shark at all. In fact, I still like sharks. Yeah, good. You were just in the wrong place at the, at wrong, the wrong time. time. There's fish jumping all over the place, so you should catch something this morning. Good yeah, luck. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Imran. Okay. A final solution to such incidents has been a local ambition in Durban since 1952, when half a mile of netting was installed offshore. The idea was simple, to catch sharks before they could reach the beaches. And the nets do catch plenty of sharks, but the barrier isn't continuous, and a third of the sharks are caught in the side of the net facing the shore. That's after they've been to the beaches. Live sharks are tagged and released. Dead ones, including this bull shark, which in South Africa they call a Zambezi have become the basis of a long-running scientific study. Jeremy, yeah, it's pretty, pretty smelly, but this is a tiger shark, of course, but any shark that's caught in the shark net, you investigate the stomach contents. The idea being to get an understanding of the role that they play in the marine ecosystem as a predator. And, I mean, this is the stomach of a Zambezi here. What's, 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 oh, that's delightful, isn't it? <laughs> what, what's in here? Well, it looks like, um, some vertebrae, possibly from a, a marine mammal. I suspect it could be a dolphin. You find a lot of fish inside the stomachs of Zambezi and, and, and smaller sharks as well. Yes, it's, it's, it's mainly fish and the elasmobranchs being sharks, particularly small sharks, and then, and then rays. What's, what's in this bottle here? Well, yeah, this, this certainly is, is one of the more unusual ones. This appears to be a domestic cat. You can see the paw, paw there. Yeah. Yes. And th this was found in the stomach of a Zambezi as well? Yes, a small little antelope. Again, probably drowned, swept into the river. 
Have you found um, human remains in a Zambezi stomach? Yes, unfortunately we have on the odd occasion. The most memorable incident was the discovery of two human feet that had been bitten off very neatly at the ankle. We suspect from the nature of the, of the, the bite that the, the shark had probably come across a victim of drowning and had literally neatly removed the, the two feet from the, from the ankle. So the shark was just scavenging on the corpse? Yes. I think that's one of the reasons why they're attracted inshore, particularly when rivers come down and flood, because they never quite know what they're going to encounter. And they, they can be a danger to us because they actually go in murky water, they go up river. Yes, but the Zambezi is the only large, potentially dangerous shark that one would come across in rivers. That's right, sharks in rivers. Bull sharks. Here in Brisbane, Australia's third largest city, they've always seen big sharks in the river. They've been seen from the bridges and people think it's an ocean-going shark that's taken the wrong turn, or maybe a shark that's covered in parasites that's come into fresh water to kill them. But the true story about the bull sharks of Brisbane River is being studied for the first time by Richard Pillins from the University of Queensland. It's only light line we're using, so it's pretty gentle. We've got a bull shark on the line, and there's a swarter scare just gone over, I don't know, just 50 feet away. How far are we from the sea? About 50 miles. That's beautiful, isn't it? I'll put the, put the bed down for him. Oh. Hold on, Rach. <laughs> the life rafts is a bed so he doesn't get injured. And that could do you a lot of damage, of course. It certainly would. If you include the ones in reserve, a bull shark can have a mouthful of over a hundred teeth. This one would be between probably four and six months old. So they're born at a fairly large size. This one here's a little male. See by the claspers over there? Oh, I see. And they use those for mating. And they get bigger with age. So these claspers will, will protrude way past here once he's a mature male. Grow right, while it's at liberty, we're able to work out how fast it's growing. Okay, and what, let me write down that uh, number for you. 52028. Yep. And 52069. 110 centimetres. So that's about four feet or so. And they can get double that size. So in this river, they can get to be eight feet long. And there's only been one attack in the Brisbane River. One fatal attack, which is 80 years ago. I bet those little children don't know there's eight foot bull sharks swimming Probably don't beneath them. <laughs> Look at that. I can't believe this a completely freshwater river and big sharks like this so near to Brisbane. Go on then. Way. Hey, that mouth. There we go. Off he goes. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. That was great to see that. This has to be one of the reasons why the bull shark is the world's deadliest. It goes where no other large sharks can, into fresh water. And not just in Australia, bull sharks are readily found way up rivers from Southeast Asia to Africa to the Americas. So here in Australia, the deadliest shark is called the bull shark. But as we found out earlier, here in South Africa, the bull shark, Carcharhinus lucas, is known as the Zambezi shark, after the African river of the same name. Anglers and fishermen here fear the Zambezi more than the great whites. The main reason bulls are the deadliest sharks is that they're found in warm waters everywhere, even far up the Amazon. Exactly the same kind of shark can attack people along North American beaches too. <laughs> By 
mud in fresh water or the sea, what stimulates a bull shark? What actually brings it to the brink of an attack? But we've got these black gloves on. Yeah. White hands can actually initiate a bite. Because if they see white, yeah. that's like a fish wound, is that right? Ex exactly. Um, very often you see fishes with wounds or, or just, you know, they have some fungus on them, whatever, like something white. It moves around and this is where the sharks go after. So waving white hands in the water, you can get a bite. It's exactly, it's not a good thing to do. So what are good things to do? Could attacks be avoided if we understood better about a shark's view of the world? about a shark's senses. To find out more about what a bull shark reacts to, I've come to a place where the sharks already live in what could be called laboratory conditions, the Oklahoma Aquarium. Home, incidentally, to the world's biggest captive bull shark. She's over eight feet long and weighs 350 pounds. And I've been given permission to do experiments with her and the other sharks here. Sharks are untamable. As soon as they sense food, their predatory instincts kick in, and when they find it, they bite hard. Wow. I hope the tests I'm going to do here will give some insight into how to avoid being on the receiving end of a bull shark bite. To get some ideas of why sometimes shark senses lead them to attack us, I'm going to do a few tests with these bull sharks. I've got all this gubbins here. There's a machine that produces electricity under the water. I've got a syringe full of a delightful odour. And I've even got shark signboards. When we get in there, the sharks are going to get very excited. Nothing should go wrong, but in case it does, I've got a bodyguard with a pistol, and if a shark attacks, that will fire a high-pressure jet into the face of the attacking sharks. Are you ready, Kenny? Sure. So here I am with all my scientific paraphernalia in the aquarium, and so far the sharks are ignoring us. They must be used to seeing people underneath them. though, their senses are too good to miss that. The question is, how can we confuse those senses enough to make them bite a person? The light's just too good to baffle them with visual cues. Sharks have pretty good eyesight. Scientists have demonstrated that. In fact, in some aquariums, shapes and colours have been used to train sharks to come to food. No, there's nothing wrong with these sharks' eyes. When they're dangerous is when they can't see so well. There's nothing like a swim in the surf at dusk or dawn, but this is precisely when sharks are most likely to be hunting. In low light, sharks can't rely on their eyes to identify prey, which means they could end up confusing humans for something they want to eat. Even when the light's OK, it's not a good idea to confuse sharks by wearing jewellery or shiny watches. To them, the glint is just like the shimmer of a fish. Now to test the aquarium shark's hearing or sense of vibration. Which underwater is pretty much the same thing. This is a coconut rattle used by South Pacific fishermen as a shark attractor. By shaking the rattle, I'm producing pressure waves in the water. Another caution. Don't go swimming with your dog. Its erratic movements have about the same effect as the coconut rattle. Sharks have one sense that we don't have, and it's a very strong one. 
They can detect electricity, something all creatures produce just by being alive. I'm hooking up this board so that we can run a charge through it. Now I'm backing off because I don't want to be near it when it's switched on. Not because of electricity, because of the sharks. The current's on. The electroreceptors in the shark's snouts pick up the signals and they swarm down to see what kind of animal is broadcasting. We turn it up and they get more and more excited. So let's try to make this feeding situation even more realistic. A soup of fish blood and oil. They're going ballistic. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near that gadget now. Another lesson. Feeding sharks can bite anything that comes near them. Shoals of fish can be a sign there's hunting sharks nearby. Stay clear. If I was still near that apparatus, those sharks could chop me to pieces. But again, it's because they're confused. They're getting blasts of signals of potential food. If a person went among them now, even though people aren't their usual prey, they'd get savaged. I think I've learnt enough about bull sharks to encounter them in the open ocean. The best place in the world to do that is Cuba. Off the coast here, there's a huge gathering of breeding bull sharks, and that's where I'm headed. But first, I can never resist a reptile. Cuban rock iguana. Look. This is the largest lizard on the island of Cuba. Can grow to be about five feet long with the tail. Getting rarer now as the keys are being developed, but there's a big population on the US Naval base on Guantanamo Bay. There's two to 3,000 of these spectacular lizards there. Believe it or not, these can be at risk from attack by bull sharks. They sometimes swim between islands, swim between keys, and when that happens, they can be attacked from beneath. These things they only feed on fruit, leaves, and flowers. Gorgeous animal. I love those bloodshot eyes. Lovely crest on the top of its head. Let's let you go now. Go on then. Boy. <laughs> Why does nearly every expert on bull sharks seem to be called Eric? Now I'm meeting Eric Fernandez Misa. Hello, must be Eric. How are you, Eric? Now you're nice to see you. And these are the sharks we're going to be meeting. So, Eric, we're going to be feeding. Adult bull sharks by hand. I mean, no chain mail gloves. No, they are a big bull sharks, and they are powerful, and they can't take a lot. All the arm full. So you take the whole arm. Off. Yeah, sure. Okay, well let's go. The sharks are over 80 feet down. And the deeper we go, the more vividly I remember how big bull sharks are. And what one nip did to Eric Ritter's leg.
Here's a friendly face. A green moray eel. These have a bite, but like sharks, they only tend to use it on people if they're confused or startled. This one just wants a piece of fish. Somehow that's made me feel a little better. I fed something and my hand's still here. The bull sharks are assembling for dinner. They're huge. She's the size of the one in the Oklahoma Aquarium, but this is the open ocean, and she's under nobody's control but her own. The truth is, they could attack us at any time if they wanted to, but we just have to trust them not to. Remember what Cuban Eric said about the chainmail gloves that people use when feeding other kinds of sharks? With a bull shark, there's no point in them. If it wanted to, it could just rip your arm off. But these are being surprisingly gentle when they take the food. Please, sharks, when it's my turn, be gentle with me too. They're trusted implicitly by Cuban Eric. He barely flinches, however close they get. Which is fine but it's my turn to feed them now, and I have to summon up the same kind of trust. That's kind of hard with my heart beating like this. This is nerve wracking. I'm just about to stick a fish in a bull shark's mouth but they seem a little nervous of a strange Englishman in a pink mask. There. Eric Ritter would be proud of me. I did it. Look, I'll do it again. This confirms what I've learned about bull sharks. They may be the biggest killers and maimers in sharkdom, but that's because they can get confused. Anyway, saying they're the biggest killers isn't saying a lot. In 2003, sharks of all species killed only four people, although bulls probably caused several deaths in remote parts of the world that went unreported. That's why most scientists are confident they're the world's deadliest shark but it's clear that even an attack from a bull is unbelievably rare. So why was Eric bitten? Yeah. Eric, I mean, 18 months ago, it happened over there in the Bahamas. I mean, it's so heartwarming to see. Leg looks pretty good now. You're even running on it. Yeah, I started running again and I'm up to about an hour. It's slow, I have to say. It's a funny way of running, but yeah, I run again. I mean, I'm, I'm never going to forget the blood. We'll talk about that in a minute, but what I'll remember is your, your bravery. I mean, you were going in and out of consciousness, but as soon as you were out of the water, you said, by the time the year's out, I'm going to be back in the water with those bull shots. And even after months in hospital, you did it. I, I don't remember that anymore, but yeah, it's true. About five months later, I uh, jumped in my first dive, actually the very same spot where I got bitten uh, to find closure. 
and uh, I was an incredible feeling. And since then, I even feel much closer to these animals than I ever did before. What, what did go wrong? You'd done that hundreds of times before. There was clear water. I wasn't moving around. There was no sediment. The shark wasn't trapped between the cameraman and you. What, what went wrong? Well, actually, two things went wrong. One problem was that we allowed the shark to come in that close. Once the shark is aware or realizes that you that the thing in front of him is aware of its presence, the shark would have reacted. So a slight turn from my side would have made all the difference in the world. And the second thing was we're in the water for a long time. The sharks were comfortable with us. And there were these little food particles that came down with the current so they attached these food particles were on our legs. So the shark was comfortable, they still smelled it. So yeah, sooner or later, these sharks wanted to know what the heck are these people? What is this? We were filming in slow motion. The bite was slowed down three yep. times. They look very gentle. Yeah, she, what we did, what well, it's called it's an exploratory bite. She wanted to get an idea because we smelled like something. Maybe we are palatable, maybe not. And it was painful, but not to the point that it was excruciating. The second bite was when she really tried to carry me into deeper water or bite through my leg. You're suddenly talking to me, you let out a cry, and you're lifted out of the water. I mean, this was an eight foot, 350 pound shark lifting a 200 pound man out of the water, and you were dragged away. You were in the air. What was happening? Her teeth were stuck in my shin bone, so she had the whole leg in her mouth. Then I realized I had to react, and um, I knew that something's gonna give, and yeah, it was my, my calf. This uh, big puppy, and uh, she really got a. <laughs> She got a good chunk out of me. There was a hundred square yards of blood in, in the water. You lost 50% of your blood. Yeah, 50% was gone. So normally that's fatal. And for whatever reason, it was not my time. Yeah, I was a lucky camper. You know, why didn't those sharks frenzy? I mean, there was all your blood in the water. The, the assistant cameraman, James Wall, jumped in to help you out. I was there, could have attacked both of us, could have gone in to attack you again. This is one of these old myths, you know, sharks do this, sharks do that. And, but we humans are not part of their food system, so they don't know what human blood is. They're not, they're not, the evolution did not focus on human blood. So accident showed us quite a few things, or proved that what we're saying all these years, the sharks don't go for human blood. They, they're not vicious animals. They don't attack for the sake of attacking. We all saw that in this accident. It's so great to see you. One Thanks, day mate. we'll go for a jog. Yeah, we could. <laughs> Bull sharks. I followed them from the nursery to adulthood. They're not ferocious, just a little temperamental. They don't like confusion or surprises, and what they can't see well they assume to be all right to eat. If they're the worst of sharks, then the only reason to worry about sharks at all is to worry about their welfare. The sea would be a poorer place without them.